What's going on, Fast Turn Radio watchers, listeners, replay catchers? Gompers, what's up, buddy? Talked to, uh, well, I guess it was a couple weeks ago I talked to Gompers now, but uh, he's doing well out there in California, always trying to do things a little bit different and in his own way. So wish him the best of luck in everything he does, because Gompers, my boy. So yeah, just a little fist bump to him. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Anna is going to be with us. She just told me that she is going to be a few minutes late. So you get to listen to me tell you a couple of things. I was going to uh, do some tips. Uh, I had a couple of things that, that I thought were interesting that came up. And it's really because of something that Anna and I talked about the other day. So I will go ahead and share. Uh, one, one tip came up because of that. The other one was just kind of one of those things you get from talking to people. Um, so the tip that I wanted to share with you guys is Anna says to know your uh, inventory levels, like your cost of goods on your inventory. So I've been looking at my inventory a lot more. And once she comes on, I'll actually give you guys the number and see what her thoughts are on that and, and all that good stuff. But in going through my inventory, I found some stranded inventory, right? Uh, I, you know, I don't know if you guys ever look at it. Um, it's on the, let's see. I should probably have it pulled up so I can tell you exactly where it's at. I think it's under inventory, manage inventory. And then there is a tab that says um, stranded, fix stranded inventory. Okay, it's kind of right at the top, middle of the screen. So you click on that link and it'll show you all the stranded stuff you have. So because I've been going through my inventory and trying to get a better handle on exactly what my business looks like and, and all that kind of stuff, that we should all know, but it's easy to kind of let go um, when you get caught up in selling. I went and I looked at that stranded inventory and I found some, I, I don't know if you guys know about these, uh, that they're long discontinued, but you know, maybe you'll get lucky. I found the bounce dryer bars and uh, Anna, you know, <laughs> Anna is on here. Uh, you know, you're sharing your screen right now, right? Let me fix that. <laughs> I don't mind if you do. I just thought I'd let you know before you clicked on something you didn't mean to and we're all watching. Um, so I was looking through my stranded inventory. I find these bounce dryer bars that for whatever reason are just showing stranded and they've been discontinued. I bought them probably a year ago or so. So I thought, what the heck, I'll put in a removal order and see if I can get the, the dryer bars back out. I'm sure they'll be beat up or whatever. They showed up the other day, still in the bag, just like I sent them, still in perfect condition, just like when I, I shipped them in. So absolutely nothing wrong with them. And I sold one yesterday for $44.99. And then I upped the price to $49.99. And I sold the other two today. So yeah, there's $150 in, in sales, a little bit of shipping and all that came out. But you know, cleared and easy, what, probably up at least $100. Um, when I, I take out the whole $4 a piece that I paid for them and the shipping that I got to pay Amazon referrals. But guys, my, my point is go through your stranded inventory. And I found another one, which is the suave uh, hair paste stuff. So I'm having that recalled right now. A four pack of that is listed for, I think, 125 So, you know, there's a couple hundred bucks just in inventory that was just sitting there for whatever reason, got stranded, and I wouldn't have bothered to look at it, except Anna told me I needed to know my inventory better. So thank you, Anna. I appreciate you uh, You're welcome. getting me to do that. So, uh, you know, there's a couple of bolos, I guess, for you, but both of them are discontinued. Chances of finding them in the store are slim to none. But I happen to find some bolos sitting in my inventory, and I'm more than happy to send those off to very happy customers now. And we are now joined by Anna Hill, the lovely, and beautiful, smart. Hi, everyone. The complete package. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, as you know, Anna, I have told everybody in this audience just what a mess my business is. I've talked to you for a few minutes on the phone telling you I am in the midst of, of getting it all straightened out. But whether you're a fan of the profit first system or not, that's kind of where all this started because yes. somebody brought up the book and I started reading it and I went, okay, this is interesting. People like it. Some don't. I'm not really here to debate the system itself, but it has led me to being more aware of what's going on with my business. You 
have brought up the point that everyone needs to to know their numbers. You hear that all the time. Know your numbers, know your numbers. I tell people, know your numbers. I don't know my numbers. Not like I should. So I'm, I'm working to get that fixed. Um, but one of, the, one of the things you brought up was the amount, uh, what, what do you call it, the cost, cost of inventory? Uh, yeah, cost of goods available for sale. There you go. Which is the amount of unsold inventory in your dollars. What did it cost you? What's in your store is a better way to say it. What do you have for sale? Yep. Okay. So because you brought that up, and, and I said it last week, and I believe it, everybody should have a little bit of kind of dead inventory sitting around. Yes. If you don't, you're not taking enough chances. Now that, that's mm -hmm. assuming that you have money sitting in the bank. Now, if you're spending every last dime and it's all selling and you're doing a great job, then that's awesome. Don't get me wrong. But if you kind of got money sitting there, you're not willing to take a risk, you're not willing to go outside your comfort zone, you know, you may be losing out on uh, opportunity. Right. So I went through mine and I pulled up my scan power report, downloaded the, the, uh, cost of goods, filled in the, you know, a couple missing numbers and all that. And I came out with, I'm going to ask Minnick because I don't have it pulled up, but it was so close. It was eerie. It was, I think $59,995. I was like five bucks shy and whatever the change was. So I was $5 shy of having $60,000 in my cost at Amazon. I don't know if that's, oh, you need my, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I feel like you're getting, I feel like you're real quiet too, Dwayne. I was struggling to hear you. Okay, let me turn my gain up. Let's all blame it on Dwayne. Yes, it's all my fault. Okay, is that better? I had my gain turned down a little bit. Or is it still low? Maybe I, here, I'll do earphones too. Maybe that'll help. Let me make sure I have my Yeti. I was playing with this earlier. Okay, I've got the Yeti still low. Man, I, I have the gain turned way up. I mean, I can like hear myself, so I don't know why. This is low, low. I have earphones on now. Maybe that'll help. Yeah, I hear you just fine. Um, okay, is it still still low, guys? Because if it is, I mean, I've got. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hmm. Um, or is there something I can do to reduce mine? Yeah, I don't know how you can actually turn it down. Um, I moved the computer way back. <laughs> all right Anna is loud Dwayne is fine okay um yeah we'll, we'll try it like that I mean this this is so loud I'm like booming in my own earphones right now so hopefully it's okay to everybody but um I don't know now and see in this what happened now I lose my train of thought uh oh inventory inventory see I got it back a lot quicker this time though <laughs> see it's Julie's Julie's fault we're always going to blame me losing my train of thought on Julie no matter what Yes. <laughs> um, no, the, so the, <laughs> she gave a little frowny face. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding, Julie. Uh, so I have about six, almost dead on $60,000 in my cost and in inventory. I don't know if, if that's good or bad or how it relates to other people. Um, currently we, in the leading the months leading up to this month, we were selling somewhere between about fifty and seventy thousand a month. Now we have taken a huge leap so far uh, in the first ten days or so of May, where we've sold a little over forty five thousand. So we are on pace to do a lot more than the seventy thousand. Um, so. I don't know how much, I don't know if there's a number. This is what I'm getting at, I guess. Is there a number that you have in mind that people should have in their inventory cost versus their monthly sales? Or does it just depend? Or is there any formula? You're the math person. <laughs> is there any way to know if you have a healthy business based on your cost of goods versus your sales? Well, I think you just kind of answered it for yourself. If you have 60000 now I'm all scared. I'm, I'm yelling. I hope this isn't too loud. <laughs> if you have 60,000 and you sold 45,000 in 15 days, that means you have, what is that? Almost, almost a month's worth of inventory in store. So if that's a comfortable amount to have as backlog, I would think yes. That would feel comfortable to me because if something happened or you wanted to take vacation that you know that your inventory will feed your business. So 
you know, it really depends on you. It also depends on if you have a holiday coming up Q4, maybe you anticipate selling more, but I'm so glad that you took the time to figure out how much you have in unsold inventory because the whole idea of the balance sheet is do you have more value than you owe? And the value is what you have in unsold inventory compared to debt. I know for you, um, <laughs> You've been very comfortable with that, but as you leverage debtors, other people who really have that as an important part of their business, taking the time to know how much they have in unsold inventory compared to what they owe is huge. I have talked to so many sellers who've said, oh my gosh, I actually owe more than I have in unsold inventory. And it's like having a mortgage or being upside down in your car. You don't want that. Okay. So you brought up a term that I just want to know, um, for, so that I am absolutely, absolutely clear. What is a balance sheet? So that's a great question. A balance sheet is a really important um, measurement of your business. It has nothing to do with sales and it has nothing to do with expenses directly. What it is, is all of your assets, which are your checking and savings accounts, your unsold inventory. Those are all of your assets. And if you have gift cards, so if you add up those numbers, you need to compare that to your liability and your equity. And your liabilities are how much you owe. So if you have credit cards or loans, and then the equity in your business is the difference between your revenue and expenses. So. I should have muted myself. I'm actually just getting a pen so I can write. <laughs> Well, I'm scared I'm screaming and deafening people. So we're just like, you know, dumb and dumber here. Yeah, I can just make all the noise I want. Nobody's going to hear it anyway. Yeah, exactly. I know I'm so nervous about it. But so if you, a simple, simple calculation is how much do you have in checking? How much do you have in unsold inventory? So if you kind of mentally do that, compare that to how much you owe in credit card. Okay. Thank you, Karen. She says I sound great. I love Karen. Sure. So if you compare that number to your liabilities, which is what you own credit cards and loans and how much you have made for the year, your revenues minus expenses, assuming you haven't distributed anything to yourself, that number of your, your assets should be greater than your liabilities and the equity. Okay. And the, the liabilities are credit cards and loans. Okay. So it's, it's kind of just like a back of the napkin, real rough calculation. It doesn't have to be precise into the penny, but just to kind of get a general idea, because really the, what you're trying to do is understand, I don't want to say the value of your business because you, one could not sell it for that, but in general, the balance sheet tells you, are you worth more than you owe? And part of your worth is what you have in your checking account and what you have in unsold inventory, assuming you have good inventory, which for the most part we, we do. I mean, of course there's some residual duds. Do you have more value than what you owe? Okay. That's, that's really all it is. And that's why the balance sheet is so important because we all know the revenues and expenses could stop at any minute. Maybe we get suspended. Maybe we have a family situation. So really you just want to make sure do I have good inventory? And am I comfortable with how much I have invested in that inventory? You know, maybe you have 2000, maybe you have 200,000. Does that number feel good to you? Does it make sense for your family and for your business's plan? Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that because you know, I, I, I watch or I listen to the webinar. I need to go back and watch it that you did uh, the other day and you covered a lot of this stuff and it was great audio right up until you like started giving the example of the fake business that you had. <laughs> and I was like, I cannot listen to this and have any prayer of following along. So I have to go back and actually watch that. But uh, I appreciate you kind of giving me the rundown. So just so people know, um, yeah, I gave you my inventory levels of like 60,000. Right. Uh, our checking account currently, we just got a good payout. We get off all the credit cards. I do use credit cards now for anyone that hasn't heard. Um, so we were even when that disbursement came out uh, and we were at last time I looked, we were at about 40,000 sitting in the bank. Uh, got, I don't know, maybe 15,000 in credit card debts right now. And so we're what 25,000 plus our 60,000 in unsold inventory that's sitting there. So that would put our business in the profitable side of what, in the neighborhood of 85,000. Well, let me, let me make sure I have my, 
paper and pen out here. Okay. So you, you have, did you say about 40,000 in the bank? Yes. Okay. And then unsold inventory was about 60 grand. Yes. Okay. So that means you have about a hundred thousand in assets. Okay. And then you said, what are the liabilities? What did you say the credit card balance was? 15,000. 15,000. Okay. So here's the other tricky part. Right now we're 85,000, but how much do you have, do you think, and if you don't want to share, I'm, I'm not trying to pry. I know that you're very open with numbers, but if you're comfortable to share, how much do you think you have in net income for the year from basically January through April that you haven't distributed to yourself? Oh, that I haven't distributed? I don't know. It's all sitting. Or are you, are you paying yourself through like a salary expense? Or are you doing, yeah, I, I, I pay myself a, a set wage every two okay. weeks. Okay. And I'm, I'm again, I'm not trying to say, let's just do it differently right now. Before the equity, you have about an $85,000 book value of your business. Okay. That's really awesome. I mean, feel good about that. Celebrate <laughs> that. Cause you know, that didn't come overnight. And if you think about it, it's, you may not have had that high of a value if you hadn't leveraged the credit cards to get to that point. And this isn't about the pros or cons of credit cards, but you know, I, I think there's some value to that because the asset that you get from it, the inventory can expand to even something larger, which is the sales. So I guess the point is if everyone's thinking about it from a basic level, if a person has 40,000 in the bank and 60,000 in inventory, that's a hundred thousand, but you have to reduce that by what you owe. So owing 15,000 in credit cards or loans, or, you know, you borrow from uncle Fred or whatever, that is the net book value of your business. And it's really good. And I think Karen said, it's a little bit like a home loan. If you have a home mortgage, let's say your home is worth a hundred thousand, but you owe 20,000, you have equity of 80,000 and the same principle applies to a business. Okay. And, and with that, I, another part of what I've started to do, and this is for the, uh, I'll, I'll have a little tip for the app people, users out there after this, but um, part of looking at my inventory is going, okay, yeah, some of this stuff is great, you know, and now I'm having to, to send it in constantly, or it was a liquidation buy that's selling through at a nice pace, and I'm happy about it. And then some of it is just the junk that's still left over from Q4. So right. I'm, I'm going through my inventory now and I'm, I'm trying to get everything repriced and I'm going to dump some of that stuff. Just, I, you know, at this point, I guess I see it as dead inventory. Some, some of this, not all of it, but some of that 60,000 is just plain dead. And right. I don't care if I make 50% of what I paid for it. I mean, I'll mm -hmm. take a loss at this point. Just give me the cash out because it's not doing me any good having some uh, what, monster high dolls. That, that's one of them that I paid $20 for. And I think they're selling for 15 now. Uh, you know, you, I just have no prayer of ever even getting my money back. Right. And maybe if I got a little lucky, you know, Q4, if I wanted to hang on to them for another six months, but I'm just finding more and more opportunities. And I'm like, Hey, I'd rather have the cash and go buy some of this good stuff over here. Right. So when I say I have 60,000, um, one that does not include any of my inbound stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's literally, there's literally at least 15,000. That's where the credit card debt came from that is on its way to the warehouse. So, so really you can net those two out to have a hundred thousand dollars total book value. Yeah. Um, and you know, in some of that stuff I'm going to take a loss on or whatever, but anyway, it has gotten my mind kind of focused on getting rid of some of this old stuff. Cause we, we guys, we do pay fees. That's another thing. I pay about $400, which is not a lot. But I pay about four hundred dollars a month in storage fees. Well, some of that is this old junky inventory that I paid for for months and months and months now, that is just not going anywhere. So I'm using App Eagle, and that's where the tip comes in. I was shown today how to actually do this through an Excel spreadsheet versus clicking one at a time and, and updating yeah. mins and, and doing the repricing that way. You can download the template and Michael Goldberg had an outstanding video that walks you through how to do that. And uh, I suggest everybody watch it. If I had the link, I would give it to you. I'm not sure. Oh, you know what? I do have the link. How about that? So I'm going to put the link in the chat for anybody that wants it. And I will try to remember to push that in the, YouTube, in the comments on the, the uh, YouTube replay. So 
if anybody wants to watch how to use the uh, spreadsheets in App Eagle to update your inventory, your, your uh, repricing stuff. Anyway, there it is. Hopefully it helps. It has helped me quite a bit. All right. So now I know what a balance sheet is. Um, what, so I know, I know my, my business looks relatively healthy. What other key aspects? I now know my, my asset number. I know my balance sheet. What's the next thing that I should know to make sure again, a healthy business. I don't care what system you're working under. People need to have a healthy business and they need to know how to make that happen or, or how to, how to evaluate it. And then they can work on where they maybe came up short in this area or that area. So what's, what's the next thing we need? You know, that's a really good question. And I think, um, I think it gets down to what actually started the genesis of all of this is how much are we paying ourselves? And I think there tends to be an all or nothingness about this in our world where I hear a lot of comments and I'm guilty of it myself. I'm putting every penny back in the business and I'm going to buy more and more and more. But if we use your example of the monster high dolls and I have some of those myself, Although I think, isn't the one that's the guy like more valuable than the other ones? It's I don't know. It's supposed to be. I don't know. Mine aren't worth I, anything. I've never found, I've found, I find the does. Actually, they all look exactly the same. I just get overwhelmed. But anyway, um, I think the next important thing is making sure we pay ourselves. And whether you use some sort of allocation methodology or um, you say I'm taking, you know, $2,000 of every payout. I think it's really important to get into a good habit of doing that. And this is a little bit woo woo and granola, but have these discussions with your spouse or your business partner or yourself even, you know, don't, don't do this because you're banking on Q4. It's not about, you know, starving yourself and, and not paying yourself until you feel like you can afford it. Do it as you go. You know, if, if you have a personal goal to take a vacation or update your deck or have a Roth IRA, for example, that's a great thing for business owners like ourselves to participate in, you know, take the time to figure out how you want to pay yourself. If you don't know how to do that, talk to your CPA or get a financial planner, you know, go to Edward Jones or talk to someone at the bank and really understand the best way to strategize so that you can, um, you know, it's like an allowance for yourself. We give it to our kids. Why wouldn't we give it to ourselves? A lot of people who do this have a spouse who's working. And so it kind of becomes sort of a gravy business. But then a lot of us have families who are depending on every single thing we do. Sometimes it's a husband and wife working together. So I think having that discussion and figuring out the strategy and working that in, don't feel, and I'm not preaching at you. I'm, you know, that's not my place. I'm just saying in general, you know, don't feel like every cent you make has to go back into the business. You know, maybe you decide that's the best strategy, but make it a conscious decision. Have sort of an awareness, like we're going to do this or say, gosh, we really want to, you know, the individual threshold for a Roth IRA is, I think it's $5,500 a person. So if you're a married couple, what is that? 11,000 a year. You put money into that after tax. And then when you take it out, it's a tax free payment to yourself. So have the conversation with your banker, your financial planner, your CPA, or go online and look it up. Some of this stuff is not that hard. I don't think Google is a great financial planner, but it's better than nothing. So that's what I think is the second most important thing. And that's what I think is so wonderful about this discussion and how it all happened is it kind of brought to the forefront how many people aren't paying themselves. I, I was blown away by that. Um, you know, for me personally, I did not pay myself for the first, I think it was seven months. I want to say I, I worked from January and I was still at at and when I started Took that in mid-March and, and somewhere around July 1st, I believe it was, Angie finally looked at me and she said, are, are you going to start paying yourself? You know, cause it, it's cool that you got this business running and, and all that, but um, we, we need to eat. I say that all the time because that, that really was the conversation that we had. <laughs> She's like, we, we need to eat. Yes, we saved up some money. We've kind of gone through that savings while you built this business up. And it wasn't much, but I was like, okay, I need to start taking something just, just to get used to the process and to, to contribute to the household. Again. Right, exactly. And it's not a badge of honor to not get paid. If that's your strategy, that's great. 
but it's not this, Oh, look at me. I didn't get paid. And I'm not judging those who haven't, but I'm just saying that that doesn't mean it's successful if you don't have to pay yourself. Yeah, don't do that. Dale said, I haven't paid myself for two years from Amazon. Now, Dale also has a full-time job. He's doing right. a killer. He's doing a killer job at running his Amazon business and he's growing it tremendously and in, in it's side income for him. And that's awesome. And he puts up numbers that are, that compete with many full-time players. Anyway, Dale's doing a great job. He doesn't need the money. No problem. This was my job. This has been my job for, for over three years now. And so for me as a husband, as a father, as a provider, I had, you know, I didn't see it as fair to me. Again, nobody's judging anyone. I'm just giving you my story. It didn't seem fair to me to look at my wife and go, yeah, you know what? I, I quit and I'm building this business, but we're just going to lean on you for the next however long. No, it, it, it's part of my job, again, as a father and a husband to contribute to the household, even if it was a little bit. So as soon as I started doing that, she went, okay, so I'm not, yeah. I'm not in this alone. You're not just doing whatever it is you're doing, you know, you start to see some of those dividends. And now I pay myself more than, than she gets paid. And we're, we're very comfortable. We're extremely happy, you know, Yes. and life is good. Pay yourselves guys. We work too stinking hard not to draw a paycheck. <laughs> and I was blown away at how many people said I haven't paid myself in months, years, uh, ever. <laughs> you know, it just, I don't get it. I, I pay myself well. I, I, I enjoy the money that I make in, in doing this. So yeah, I'm with you, please guys. Even if it's a little bit, pay yourself. Yes, absolutely. Or pay your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so when I do pay myself, let me ask you about this. One, one thing that I did get in the habit of because I did not want to wake up on April 15th at the time, March 15th, if you're LLC, whatever, when you file your taxes and go, oh my right. God, I have no money for taxes and I'm just going to take whatever I can and grab it out of the business. One thing I decided to do was when I pay myself, I would take it from, and tell me if this is right, wrong, or whatever, uh, I would take it from the business checking, deposit uh, electronic transfer straight into our personal checking, and then I took 20% of whatever that transfer was, and I stuck it in the savings account, and I said, that's for taxes. And for me, that was, you know, I figured 20%, and it probably ought to be a little higher than that, but that 20% was kind of, if we're in the 20% tax bracket at the end of the day, when everything's accounted for, right. then I should be covering my part roughly of the taxes. Is that, um, and Kathy says, I use a mental 25% for taxes. So let me address Kathy for a second. When you say a mental 25%, what exactly are you you're not moving the money then you just leave it in your personal account and you just know you can't touch it. Cause I, I can't do that. That's one place. If, if it is in our personal account, I, I will touch that money. I can, <laughs> leave, it. I can leave it in the business account and, and just know that I can't, and I can put it in the savings and know not allowed to touch it. If it's in our joint checking account, that is free game for whoever wants it. If Angie shopping or, you know, mint julep or whatever the, next we're getting closed through the mail all the time around here so whether it's her going through it or i'm going through it that's just kind of our fun money yeah so to me there's no way i could just kind of mentally go no no we need to leave a certain amount so that's why i use the the, ta the uh, savings account for taxes am i doing that right or wrong? i think that's a great idea okay that's a fantastic idea because you're right. You don't want to depend on, oh my gosh, is it going to be there when it's due? And, and part of the challenge of our line of work is we don't know. We could accidentally stumble upon some wonderful item and make a bazillion dollars. Well, we'll have made enough revenue for saving as we go to cover the taxes for that. And it's a lot harder to do it our way. If you're a W-2 employee, they take it out and then you get to tax return at the end of the year. So we have a little bit more responsibility to at least set up a system, whether it's 20% or 25 or 30, or maybe, you know, you just want to do 10% and say, well, I know I'm going to have this extra I'm going to have to cover. So it's about making a system and sticking with it. I don't think there's any hard or fast allocation that, makes sense for every single person. Um, it also depends on the big picture of the taxes. Like you said, maybe 
you have a spouse who also has their own business or maybe there's a situation where you had a third business and there was some you know different tax stuff going on but it kind of comes along with paying yourself you know, have a strategy to save something for taxes. And I'm just a big believer in getting into a good habit. If you're saving, you're going to pay yourself. You're going to have probably enough for taxes, maybe a little bit too much or maybe not quite enough, but it won't be code red. I hate, I hate financial code red things where, you know, we're all grown ups now and we know how to avoid that. And just kind of putting a little bit aside in a methodical way is really all it takes. That makes sense. Now, as, as business owners, um, do you recommend people take, you know, and when I say business, I mean LLC, S Corp, uh, C Corp, if anybody went that direction, I don't know anyone that has, but maybe people have. My understanding from my CPA, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, that you do not pay the Social Security and Medicare taxes on profits drawn from the business. So if I take an only share, I don't owe those that same 15% roughly that 15% social security tax on that money. Um, so do you, should we be setting aside corporate taxes also, or is that, is there a special, is there any special handling for withdrawing profit versus taking a paycheck? Well, that's a good question. And I want to be careful to not get into giving people tax advice, but what you just explained is exactly right. I agree completely. And in general, the way that it works is, you know, we were talking about the balance sheet and the income statement. So on the income statement, if a person was to pay themselves an owner salary, which should be a regular specified amount, sometimes even using a payroll service, then yes, that is subject to the self-employment taxes and all of those other things. Um, but if you were to pay yourself an owner's draw, that comes out of the balance sheet. And what that means is there's not an income effect. So if you're paying yourself a draw, that is not an expense. It doesn't have anything to do with your income statement. That means it goes directly out of your checking account straight into your pocket. It doesn't reduce your income. And what that means is it has a different taxable, there's a different taxable event on that versus when you pay yourself a salary. And I don't want to, I feel like I'm already getting into the weeds. It becomes complicated very quickly, but the the reason that the IRS requires this is they don't want people to not pay themselves a salary and then at year and say, Ooh, I'm taking it all out and draw. I don't owe any taxes. doesn't work that way. If only we would all be doing that. <laughs> but the idea is to pay yourself a regular consistent, I think they call it reasonable salary. And then you do have to pay the self-employment taxes and all of that on it. So talk to your CPA, get that set up right. But there's definitely a, a tax strategy to having an owner's salary versus an owner's draw. And you have to almost separate yourself. There's the business person and then there's the individual person. And the individual person gets the money. But the way that the business person, the business entity handles the taxation of it is completely different. Okay. Oh. So there's a little bit of a savings there. And that's why I always tell people, I know that you don't like having to pay for a CPA to do your taxes, but it's so much more than filling out a form. You can strategize about entity structure and you would be surprised the savings. And the reason that it also matters is, is you move this money out of your business, then you can do things to save for retirement, which I think should be a huge goal of everyone in some form you know, have that Roth IRA, talk about a cell, a, a SEP where you have the self-employed pension plan. There's so many things that we can do. You know, if, if you have a good CPA, they're not going to charge you for every single second they're talking to you. Um, have these conversations. So not only pay yourself today, but how are you going to pay yourself and your family when you retire? Because I don't think anyone of us wants to be doing this when we're 80. I'm not going to UPS when I'm 80. It's not happening. Yeah, I'm with you. I am not good about it, but it, that is at least in the back of my mind. I've gotten, uh, I've taken these baby steps of, of paying myself just a little. Well, I went from paying myself nothing for seven months, paid myself a little bit, paid myself a little bit more. Now I'm to where I'm drawing a very comfortable salary. And I do that every payout, take the same amount. And if we happen to go to Disney, that's when I kind of take a bonus. That's what I consider it. That would yeah. be, I guess, the, the profit where I go, okay, we're going to Disney. Let's take a few extra thousand to pad the account because I know we're going to go spend lots of money. Uh, the next step for me 
is to really hammer down my business so I understand exactly what my profits are and know that they are what I think they are and all that kind of stuff and start setting that money into retirement. Um, that, that is important and I've neglected it since I left at and Oh my gosh, we all do. It's so easy because it seems so far away and unimaginable and fantasy. But don't you feel like accounting and owning a business is an evolution where you first start with like this mountain of receipts, you think, I don't know what to do. And then you slowly have a basic system and then you build on that and you build on that. And I always tell people, don't try not to get overwhelmed with the end step. Start where you are. Just start where you are. And how can you take a baby step to build on that? And then when you build on that, then you can add one more thing and one more thing. Don't feel like you have to get to the very end perfect accounting system right from this point. It's, it's, it's not possible. It becomes overwhelming and I wouldn't want to do that. I mean, nobody does that. You don't start off with this confusing mess and then all of a sudden magically have the perfect accounting system. Just start where you are. Yes, definitely. That, yeah, Mike said great advice. I agree totally. That is great advice. Start where you are and, and figure out where you got to go and take the steps to get there. Um, let's see. It was Mindy who asked, can we pay ourselves hourly or does it have to be a salary? That's, do you? Oh, I thought you, know you were answering question? that, Dwayne. No, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I pay myself a salary. I assume you can pay yourself however you see fit because the IRS <laughs> says reasonable. So, yeah. You know, it really depends you're on the expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it depends on the structure that you have. If you run your business through Schedule C, it doesn't matter. Um, but you're right, it's reasonable. Um, so if your business makes the bottom line is, you know, ten thousand dollars and you pay yourself nine thousand, that's probably not reasonable. But you know, maybe it is because that is what it took to get you through you know, from day to day. So I would just talk to your CPA. I really don't want to give okay. you guidance on that and misadvise. There you go. That, that's, yeah, at the end of the day, you have to talk to your CPA, guys. Anna is nice enough to share her thoughts and opinions, but she's not allowed to give actual tax advice or whatever, at least not on this show. I'm not allowing it. I don't know if you are in real life. <laughs> For the purpose Sue Dwayne if something goes wrong. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. What, um, yeah, Bob, just so you know, Bob said, Anna makes it sound so simple until I wake up tomorrow morning and go, oh, sh yeah, <laughs> that's, that's it. Everything sounds good. And then when we, uh, and then when, when it comes down to it, it's like, man, I got to get these numbers in order. I got to get this inventory in order. I got to get this stuff repriced and, and you know, but welcome to business ownership. If you didn't want to deal with all these headaches, then you could have gone to work for someone else, which is so much worse in my opinion, but. Yes, I agree. All right, so balance sheets, pay yourself, uh, P&L statements. Any, any how-tos or easy way or preferred um, or anything that you've seen that works better than others or? You know, I don't know. I feel like that's the one thing that everyone has a really good handle on. How much did I sell and what did it cost me to sell it? I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, prof um, not as well. <laughs> I, think, I, I think people have a decent idea, but I can tell you myself, I am so far behind in my QuickBooks, I can't pull up my report and go, yep, yeah, here it is. But uh, I did run my numbers for April, hard, fast, uh, all on, on cost of goods sold. It didn't have anything to do with dead inventory or bad buys or anything. Right. It was just straight up, uh, you know, cost of goods sold and, you know, ran the, the 20, about 21% profit margin, which I was happy with and all yeah. that stuff. So, yeah, I, I think we do. Um, profit and loss does seem to be the one thing that people kind of understand. And it really is no more complicated, correct me if I'm wrong, than your, your sales minus your expenses. So your, your revenue minus expenses mm -hmm. equal your profit, right? That's it. You know, actually, I, I want to add something. I had an interesting conversation today. Someone messaged me and what they had done was they had taken, you know how we get the settlement statement and it says, these are your gross sales minus the fees and this is your cash in the bank. And what this person had done is they took the number that was, you know, the cash in the bank and they just recorded that as their sales. And then what they did is they took all their expenses after that. And so the bottom line was right. 
And the reason they messaged me was because there was a problem with their CPA and the IRS also, where the IRS said, well, you got a 1099 and your 1099 was much higher. So I just want to mention to people, even if the bottom line is right, it's really important to make sure you account for it correctly. You can't just say, well, you know, the net, net result is right because the IRS is going to be looking at that 1099. So the onus is on you to say, I know this is what Amazon said my sales were, but this is what it's reduced by. So don't do what that person did in general is probably fixable, but do you really want to fix it after the fact when something happens? No. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just mentioning that most people know that, but it's so easy to want a shortcut because you'll still figure out, you know, we can't control the Amazon fees for the most part. So the temptation is to say, well, this is how much my cash in the bank was. I'm just going to reduce that by my actual cost. And that's what I made and try not to do that. I know it's tempting, but don't cause you'll be sorry. I, I do that when I crunch my numbers because there, there's no reason for me to take the Amazon sales and then subtract the Amazon fees, which is what you end up with your payout. You know, right. there's some mistakes in there, but I, I trust Amazon. Maybe I'm wrong in doing so. Exactly. So for me to just crunch my own numbers to give, to you guys, you know, who are watching or listening, no big deal. But yeah, when you're when you're reporting to your CPA, that's why Amazon gives you a 1099 that looks like it's twice as much as what your actual payouts were. And you're like, I didn't make this much. Well, no, you didn't because Amazon took 30% between the, their uh, you know pick and pack fees and their all that. So yeah, guys, make make sure I, you you report that as earnings on one side, but then take out the Amazon fees on the other. Make sure you're not that you do make sure your accountant knows that's what's really going on. Right. Just at some point along the way. And it's a great like quick summary to say, well, this is what I had in my pocket minus this, this is in general. It's, it's a great kind of shortcut, but this person has a little bit of a mess and I felt bad for them. And they even said, I wish I'd done it differently, but this seller's not the first one who's told me that just a suggestion when you're really, kind of tightening up your accounting, take the extra 10 seconds to add the detail. I have a template in my group. It's free. Go get the template. You just drop the numbers in and then you do a three line journal entry. So instead of one that comes from the bank, you go in and literally it's probably five minutes to make the adjustment. And I just want to say if anyone wants help, message me, we'll do a screen sharing and we'll do it together. I'm here to help you. You're awesome. And yeah, uh, your group accounting, we will go is by far the best accounting group that I know. It's the, the only one I... <laughs> Therefore, it is the best. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we talk about this. Your group stuff, is the best fast turn group I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it's a great group, though. You have a ton <laughs> of free information to help Thank people you. with this stuff, and it's awesome. So, guys, yeah, go. If you're not a part of it, please join. It is uh, facebook.com slash groups slash accounting. We will go. And Anna's got a ton of free information, great advice, great discussions. So if there's anything that you want to follow up with from what you hear tonight, go to her group and follow up. Um, that is the best place to find Anna. So, uh, yeah. And Kathy says everyone should go to Anna's Facebook page. Thank you, Kathy. It's such a good motivation to keep clean books. Yes, I, I am. My, my book is <laughs> dirty. Well, but that's a good point because I really try not to judge. <laughs> I try, I, my job is not to judge people. I just want to help people where they are. So if a person says, I know I haven't done this, I can't, I, I feel like sometimes I'm not Catholic, but I understand in the Catholic religion, there's confession. I feel like a, I'm a Catholic priest. People come to me, they're like, well, I need to tell you I haven't done this. I'm like, I really don't care. I'm not the sheriff. I'm not the police. You don't have to have pretty books. I just want to help people with where they are. So don't feel like if you have a question, don't feel like it's dumb or you should have done something different. You know what? We all should have done different things. We're human. It's okay. Just go to the group, look for the answer. If you don't see it, send me a message or post for a friend who has a question and we'll get you on track. And Dwayne and I talked, what was it last week about, the tendency people have to think about accounting where it has to just be this big, complicated, arduous nightmare. And I want to emphasize, and I kind of touched on it earlier, but I want to emphasize it doesn't have to be like that. You know, really don't think of it as this insurmountable task. Think of it as something you can learn. And like Dwayne said, welcome to owning a business. And if you really don't want to learn or it's a nightmare and you hate it, 
then just accept the fact you need to pay someone to do it. It's not a big deal. Treat yourself to that. I treat myself to someone preparing my taxes every year because I hate doing taxes. And I think it's a specialized field and I don't want to miss anything. So I do that. And I gladly pay every single year. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. I absolutely agree. I am, yeah, I, I sent it over to you. I have a proposal finally from my bookkeeper who works for my CPA. Uh huh, good. I works for, you know, $275 a month. And I asked Anna, I shot her a message. I said, this, I don't know if that's a good price or not. And she thought that was a great price for everything yeah. included. So I'm excited about it. Could I do my own books? Yeah, I probably could, but Lord, I have no interest in doing it. I would much rather pay somebody $275. Yes. That, that headache away. And then at the end of the year, which was my plan and I, I let fall apart, but hopefully it'll come together this year. <laughs> when it comes time to file, it's just all done. And there's yes. really nothing for me to put together. It's just, you know, look it over, make sure everything looks right. Of course, you want to know what's going on in your business, but verify it and go, yeah, that's it. And you know, have it signed off and sent off and all that good stuff. Exactly. All right. Uh, we're coming down to the, we've got a, just a few minutes left, but I do want to ask one last thing. And then any, any questions you guys have, uh, hopefully we'll have a few minutes for, but budgeting, do you have any advice? Once you, you know, your balance sheet, you've started paying yourself, you know, your profits, you know, your losses, you know, you got your, your, your P and L statement done. And to me, the, the part that I am missing the most because I have not done a great job of all these others is budgeting. How do you, do you have any kind of system in place for how you decide what percentages or what dollar amount you allocate to different parts of this business or any, any advice as far as that goes? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I, there's a couple of ways to do it and really what budgeting depends on is having good financial records. It's really hard to budget when all you have is a tax return. And I know I'm a broken record, have your books in order, but really that's so important. <laughs> and we almost have to think of our business as two businesses. One of them is the Q4 business. And then the other business is January through, I guess, you know, the end of, of Q3. And I don't mean to stereotype because some people do very well year round, but honestly, it's really hard to have even earnings. So get to know the seasonality of your business and try to parse out and then, and then budget it that way. Maybe say, okay, you know, the first three quarters, I want to have X in revenue or X is my bottom line and, and try to back into it that way. But I encourage all of you to not try to budget based on a tax return. The only thing you can really budget based on the tax return, I think, is what you pay yourself. I mean, that's kind of it. It's really hard to budget inventory because inventory doesn't even go on a tax return. I mean, it does as part of the cost of good sold calculation, but, you know, it's, it's really hard to do that. So, you know, once more, I slipped in how important it is to have your books in order. But um, I think you touched on the main things, you know, paying yourself. You've got a budget for that. You've got a budget for taxes. That's really important. I think if people are able to budget for those two things, then they can start refining and saying, okay, after I've taken care of those necessities, I've fed myself and I've fed the government. Now I want to feed my business. We can't really do anything about a lot of things. Shipping supplies are what they are. Um, you know, dues and subscriptions are what they are. Professional fees are what they are. The only thing we can really manage is how much we put into our business. Um, and Dwayne, I think kind of where you shine is helping people understand how important it is to turn inventory and not have that dead stuff sitting there, taking the time to look at that. So, um, you know, once you get the basics done, then you can start digging into the details. So those are my thoughts on budgeting. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's, it's, it's sort of an evolutionary process. You can't just say, I'm going to budget. You know, you have to prioritize. All right, first I got to pay myself and the government. Now I can start feeding my business. How do I want to do that? Okay. Yeah, that, that does help. And, and Michelle brought up the point budgeting and business forecasting. Yes. Good so, point, Michelle. Yeah, once you kind of know what's happened in the past. So for example, just our, our growth side, one, one very consistent thing that's happened was we went from a hundred thousand to 200,000. And then we jumped up. Well, I guess not that consistent. I was thinking we doubled each year, but we didn't because we jumped up to about uh, 580,000 last year. So this is sales. So 100,000 sales, 200,000, 580. And we'll probably do somewhere between a million and a million and a half this year. So 
Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the, now I do need to, to go back and get all this stuff tightened up. So I know if my, how did my profits follow? You know, did they, did they follow the same percentages? My guess is not quite. You know, I don't think, though my revenue almost tripled, my guess is my, my profits did not, just because I know I took lower margins in order to right. sell some of those products. Um, but I guess you can kind of look once you have a little bit of history and use that to gauge what you need to do going forward, how much you need to allocate. Is that is that yeah. the best way to forecast? Is there another way? I think that's a, I think that's a great idea. And I think your analysis was exactly what people need to do and say, all right, well, this doubled, you know, my sales doubled, but my bottom line didn't. What is, what is costing me so much to achieve these extra sales? Can I shave something off? Maybe it means hiring a helper where you temporarily have more expenses, but in the long run, you can get more inventory sent in. Maybe it means you use a prep center. Maybe it means you use a combination of those two things. Maybe it means in addition to that, you're going to leverage gift cards or debt or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I think those are really good things to look at. And it's almost like an art, not a science. I don't think there's one exact example. You know, some people might live in a region where they can have access to a certain line of, I don't know, shoes or whatever that's very profitable. It's, it's a very personal kind of decision, but that's why it's really fun, you know, to look at January last year versus January this year. Q1 last year versus Q1 this year. I think it's fascinating. It's really fun. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I just, I wish my books were in order so I could get those bottom line numbers. Which is You'll get there. Me, You're on your way. <laughs> um, and, and another thing after talking with you that I kind of went back and, and after reading the Profit First book that kind of got my, my mind going with all this stuff, what it, and you mentioned it a few minutes ago, um, I, what I call operating expenses. Yes. You know, the, the, the subscriptions that we have, the... Um, I don't know, you rattled off a few things that kind of fell under that, that, you know, the office supplies, the stuff that makes your business run. Um, you know, and I, I was looking, we, we have a very lean business. We don't have a warehouse, so we don't have the extra insurances and utilities and all that kind of stuff. So our operating expenses, and maybe I'm missing something, but that's basically just our subscriptions and office supplies, essentially, which is what makes our business go. It was only about $600 for the month of April. And I looked at that and went, man, for, you know, we made, I, th I think our profits, our gross profits were $14,000 for April. I went, crap, it only costs us 600 bucks to run. Now, does, does correct me if I'm wrong, paying, paying uh, an owner or uh, paying a, a salary to yourself, owner's pay, uh -huh. your salary, that does not go under your operating expenses correct? Do you know, is that, well, are you saying in on taxes, but if I, if I, this can right, be, right. Because that's something, they yeah. Figure out their operate, their monthly operating expenses and they right. put in their salary. And I said, no, that doesn't really apply. But does do your workers salary? Does that, is that part of your operating expenses? There's a couple ways to do it. I'm just going to generalize. I know we're kind of running short on time, but they call it above the line and below the line. And so below the line are all those general and administrative expenses. And general expenses are things like, you know, the office supplies and shipping supplies. And then administrative expenses would be if you had some helpers and things like that. Then you could have below that, you could have the other expenses, which would be things like um, interest expense, or cost of financing or an owner's salary. So you can actually break it out because there are some things that you can control and some you can't. Of course, you can control how much you pay someone, but at a certain point, they're not going to work for you if you don't pay them enough. But, you know, if you have to short yourself, you may not love it. Your family may not love it, but it's something that you have control over. So I think separating all of those out into those categories is really important. And a lot of people along those lines stress out about, oh my gosh, I'm using a prep center. How do I account for that? I put that in my cost of goods sold because I can't sell the inventory without that. And also I have to pay it no matter what. But other people put it in there below the line, the general and administrative expense. And we have this discussion all the time in my group. 
Talk to your CPA, of course, but the secret is consistency. Make sure you account for it consistently. So if you do it one year one way, do it the next year the next way. And make sure you understand where all of these expenses fall in your income statement. So to your point, if you have all of these expenses, make sure you understand where they are. Um, so I hope that answered the question. It, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, but if you're analyzing it and you're looking at it, I think your suggestion to that person was a great one. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And that, that does help. And, and just the, the biggest takeaway for me in that is consistency. Yeah. Oh, big time. Yes. If somebody looks at your books, cause that's what this is all about. And at the end of the day, right. Is right. God forbid somebody get audited. You want to be able to show this is the, the, trail and this is where I came up with that number and here's the proof of right everything we did to get to that point so yeah whether, whether prep center is cost of goods or prep center is a service I guess right at the end of the day it really doesn't matter as long as you can show whoever is looking at it that's where you came up with the number Right. They don't want to see Mickey Mouse around. And I think the effort and the intention is really important. And if your intention is to have clean books and you do it consistently, that goes a long way. Fantastic. All right. Anybody have any last questions? We got about three minutes left. If anybody speak now or forever, hold your peace. <laughs> yeah. So has anybody ever started a conversation with um, Anna? It's been six months since my last reconciliation. Is that like how they come to you as, as Anna, the <laughs> bookkeeping priest, uh, listens to? Yeah. What did someone say? Brother Anna. I love that. <laughs> Karen said that. It always starts with, I really don't want to admit this, but, or it'll say, I know I should do, or I know I shouldn't, but, <laughs> but, you know, I think our community is so wonderful and not to get mushy, but there are so many nice people and people really want to do well. And that's why it's kind of sad for me when people struggle with accounting. I know it may come a little bit easier to me. But if you just kind of slow down and start where you are and think about what you want to do, I'm here to help. And it's not just me. There are so many people in my group. I couldn't do it without the people in my group who contribute. I don't know if you know this. I'm the only admin. Maybe I'm a control freak. I'm the only one that has any power. Don't accidentally <laughs> kick yourself out. That's oh, the only bad thing about being the only I know. I'm scared of that. <laughs> uh, you may want to appoint somebody who does that, that you trust that's in the group. Actually, I do have one person, okay. KIB, because I was on vacation. I, and you know, I was thinking that you should just have Yeah, I, I do have that, but something weird I, happened. I couldn't do my group without all of the wonderful, there's other CPAs and sellers and anyone listening, thank you so much for your contributions. All right. And uh, Michelle is on the right track. I just want to give her a shout out because yes. she said, I have worked three solid eight hour days to get QuickBooks set up and January, January through April entered with my new bookkeeper. It was worth every single second. Yay. So, you know, and that's not that bad for three months. That, but yeah. That's, congratulations. That is an accomplishment. You know, my, my, my bookkeeper, the one thing she did come back with that kind of got to me a little bit was she said, um, I need you to go through now. I've got, uh, what is it? I think October, at least November, November through April that needs to be entered into QuickBooks. And so six months worth of bank statements. And she said, I know you have a lot of this stuff in QuickBooks, but I need you to go through and just annotate on every statement on every line, what category it goes into. And I'm like, man, if I'm going to do that, I might as well just punch the numbers into QuickBooks myself because holy cow you know you're talking november december the two busiest months yeah it's a lot been four months of steady growth like that is so michelle i feel your pain on that i don't know what i'm gonna do i'm almost considering just kind of doing it myself and then handing them the, the new file and saying okay we'll start um may and you guys can take over from there but anyway it's uh yeah she expected it to take two weeks good for you michelle that's awesome anyway, so i i know what kind of a scary it's daunting, isn't it? And it gets worse every day. It's like dieting, like, oh, Monday, I'll just start next Monday. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Every day I don't do it. It's like I'm another day behind. I'm another, you know, 100 transactions behind or whatever. You know, it's just, oh, my God, it's awful. But, Anna, thank you so much for being on. I get a feeling I'm going to have you back if you don't mind. I would love it. I would love it, love it. I can talk about this all day long. Don't let me do that, but I really could. So anytime, it's an honor. Thank you, Dwayne. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I want to bring you on. I want to kind of show the audience my growth. You know, I've shared all my mistakes. Hopefully I can 
bring you guys over the next few months and show you the other side of all this and, and show you what Anna and I work out. Um, if she's going to hopefully help me get yes. my stuff together. So, uh, and, and maybe we can help some of you guys along the way and let you know that you're not alone because there are people like Michelle out there who took the initiative, even though it, it daunting is the perfect word for it, this daunting task of getting caught up, but she did it. And if she can do it, you can do it. If, if you can do it, I can do it. We can all get this stuff straightened out and, and know, truly know our numbers. Yes. So, I right. agree. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Uh, there will be no show next week. I, am, I will not be here next Wednesday. So uh, you got a couple of weeks. Let's, let's get together in a couple of weeks, everybody. Awesome. How, how we've done in getting our stuff together. And hopefully Very good. some good news to report back. All right. Anna, again, thanks so much for your time and your knowledge and sharing it with us. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back soon. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Good night. Bye. All right. Thank you guys. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And um, if there's anything in the meantime, please PM me. You heard Anna, you can send her a PM. If you're in her group, definitely post in the group. If you want to get a hold of me, just tag me in uh, Fast Turn Radio is the best place. And uh, until next time, um, hopefully you guys go make lots of money, get your books in order, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye guys.